How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's uh, Lumix live session. We are actually back live this week. Um, we are... Hopefully everything's going to stay nice and stable with the internet and everything here. Um, for those that caught last week's episode, um, we do base these out of uh, Texas. So with everything that's happened over the last uh, week and a half, things are starting to get back to normal. Internet's one of those things that just keeps like connecting, then disconnecting, then connecting, then disconnecting. So hopefully we can at least get a good solid hour hour out of this. Um... So yeah, uh, this week's stream is the actual original one that we had planned for last week. I know a lot of you guys had uh, uh, joined us over on the pre-recorded one that we uh, uh, were able to at least get out something last week for everybody. So uh, thank you all so much for watching that one, and thank you so much for uh, joining us on this week's session as well. Uh, if this is your first Lumix Live, uh, welcome. These are our weekly streams that we do with photographers, videographers, industry people, you name it, we have them on uh, to just have conversations about either new products or uh, uh, different styles of photography. We talk about photos, video as well, and also provide you guys some tech uh, information on you know, how to capture new styles of video with the cameras and, and also cover some lenses as well. Um, I know a lot of you guys uh, may have some questions, so throughout the stream, if you have a question, make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras uh, in the chat, and that will let myself and Jack Salamanchuk see the questions that you guys uh, are posting to us. Um, sorry for the little bit of a change here. I forgot to adjust my screen here so I can actually read all of your questions. Um, and the way to get your questions over to us is to tag at Lumix cameras on the YouTube channel. And, uh, that way Shiv and I will be able to, uh, kind of address things that come up for you guys. I uh, last bit of kind of covering info here is, uh, hope you all remember that we have the Lumix pro services system, uh, that is available, Globally, uh, but for this particular case, these two links are set up for the U.S. group since this is where we're based out of. Uh, we have the Platinum service as well as the Red membership. So the Red membership is the entry-level one. Uh, it gets you that three-year warranty. It gets you uh, in the system so that your cameras are registered. You know if something goes wrong, you have the ability to go in and get service done with them. Uh, the Platinum service is the designed uh, platform for the, you know, kind of more discerning or the harder used uh, camera systems. Uh, so if you're someone who's using your equipment professionally day in and day out, the Platinum service is probably a really good choice for you. Uh, there are always promotions going on on how to get into the program, um, different levels of requirements. So definitely check that out uh, if you think it's something that's relevant for your work. Um, I think at bare minimum. Getting on that red level is probably a smart thing to do since it's free uh, and it gets you your three-year warranty. So uh, you can use the QR codes there. Or just go to lumix.pro.us uh, in the United States, uh, or you can just look up the Lumix uh, Pro Services for service in your region. So with that... Um, we have a really cool, exciting, uh, session for you guys today. We are going to be talking about a lot about the new 70 to 300 millimeter S lens that came out, uh, last week, uh, as we had originally planned to do. Uh, and I'm going to be joined by Shiv Verma, one of our ambassadors here in the U S, uh, to talk about his experiences with the lens. And we're going to talk about some, some of the photos that were taken with it too. So, Hey Shiv, how are you doing? Oh, thank you, Sean. I'm doing fine. It's uh, it's good to see that you're back to partially normal. <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. Yeah. Oh. yeah. You know, I mean, harrowing experiences are, are always, uh, you know, good to uh, get you up to snuff with how to handle it the next time. So hopefully you don't have <laughs> yeah. to go through it again. And uh, for the audience, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us today. Uh, you know, I, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed Sean's programs as he's been uh, doing them now for what it's nearly a year now uh almost a year now yeah coming up yeah, in about uh, yeah. April I mean yeah so there's great stuff and you know if uh, you know if you subscribe and listen to it live I think it really helps because you get to answer uh, get to ask questions that get answered vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know watching it later on as a recorded session uh, the, the interaction is that much less. And so I think, you know, more folks who 
enjoy the product line, who use the product line and want to get more experience with what others are doing, uh, you know, clearly this is a platform that I would recommend 100%. So thanks, Sean. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so uh, just as a note for everybody, if you guys see some weird oddities with the the um, broadcast today, just bear with us. Uh, obviously, like we said before, we had some issues with power outages and all that kind of fun stuff down here, and I'm getting some warnings randomly on uh, the YouTube back end. So uh, just bear with us. We're always going to try to keep it running as smooth as we can. Um, so Shiv, I... Uh, Obviously today, you know, we wanted to talk about the 70 to 300 millimeter lens. I know that you've had a decent amount of time uh, hands on with it uh, since we started having them here. Uh, can you um, kind of give everybody a bit of a background as to um, who you are uh, with a photo you know, as a photographer, um, what what styles of photography you like to do? Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Sure. I mean, uh... The one thing that you know I've been involved with is technology. I spent all my life in the computer world, and you know cameras are really no different. I mean they've got some tremendous you know computing power in them. So you know the transition from being a corporate geek, as you might want to call it, <laughs> to a photo geek was quite an easy transition. Um, I've actually, you know, been photographing since I was about 13 years old and uh, have sort of stayed with it as my primary hobby um, and, and thoroughly enjoy it. I mean, every uh, opportunity I get, you know, I want to be out there with a the camera capturing, you know, what I uh, can. Uh, it's not just recording of memories, but also uh, just the fact that you can create so much. And it's an artistic tool, and I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. Now, you know, having become a Panasonic uh, ambassador, one of the uh, nice things about that role is that you get to try out products, test them out, uh, and, and put them through the ringer, if you want to call it that, before they go out as a released product. So. I had the pleasure of, uh, you know, getting the 72300 uh, and putting it through the works. The unfortunate thing is with all this pandemic going on, my ability to travel as what I normally would have done is taken it out into the field and to somewhere in Africa or somewhere in Asia. But it was kind of restricted to, to being, you know, around the confines of my state uh, here in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even so, uh, a truly a pleasure of a lens to use. And I think one of the, the nicest things, and if you listen to Sean uh, last week, is the fact that it is so nicely balanced. It's such a light lens. Um, and as far as performance is concerned, there's very little that one can say isn't great about it. Uh, in, in every way. I mean, the, the, the way you hold it, um, you know, it's probably, I think it's about half the weight of the 70 to 200 to 8. Uh, so yeah, something you know, like from that. a feel and a balance point of view, yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, I have one uh, right here just to give you an idea. Let me just flick over and just show you the difference between the three lenses. The one over here is the 70 to 200 2.8. That's the F4. And this is the 70 to 300. I mean, just... From a size and a weight comparison, it's just a, a great carry about long lens, which otherwise, you know, even if you look at 100 400s as a standard carry about lens, they call it, um, doesn't fit this profile. I mean, this is a profile mm. that's beautiful, it's small, it's light, and man, does it, you know, produce gorgeous images. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, that, in a nutshell, that's uh, some of the key criteria about this lens that I like. Uh, it has a 77 millimeter, you know, uh, filter thread, which, you know, basically makes it pretty universal. The larger lens, the 2.8, has an 82 millimeter uh, filter thread. So, you know, if you've got one of those and you need to use a step down, go ahead and do it. But uh, I tell you, from a visual representation of how this lens works. Uh, the switches, you know, it does have a limiter switch, which I like. 
uh, particularly, you know, giving you the range of a full or, you know, three meters to infinity. And if you're doing any kind of wildlife photography, you like to get the lens not to hunt, uh, you know, from the closest focusing distance to the farthermost fo focusing distance. So the limiter switch helps. Uh, yeah. Of course, like every lens now, you've got an AM, uh, AFMF switch. Uh, this does not have a clutch mechanism like some of the other pro lenses have, but really it's not a big deal. I mean, it, it works fabulous irrespective of whether the clutch is there or not. And then the last yeah. thing, which I think is really good for photographers who like to keep their lens on their cameras slung over their shoulders or you know, and carry a tripod in the other hand, is the ability to lock it so that it doesn't creep while you're, you know, walking around. And I tell you, the lock is very solid. I mean, it just does not budge, period. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've had locks on other lenses. Uh, just as an example, the 100-400 has a lock, which is not a switch lock, but it's a color lock. And yeah. it, it does the job, but this is just completely, you know, solid as solid can be. So yeah. with that, Sean, I mean, you know, if you've got any questions about the lens itself in its physical state, uh, you know, we can answer those or we can just move ahead with discussing other features. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's see. There, uh, just a reminder, everybody, if you guys have questions, tag at Lumix cameras in the uh, chat and we'll be able to to address them. Um, I know the one question here that came from Albert was, you know, does this lens come with a lens hood? Yes, it does. Um, yes. I don't know of any Lumix lens that doesn't come with a lens hood when it has a lens hood as, as an, like an original accessory. Yeah. So it, it comes with one. It's there. And by the way, uh, all the new lens hoods have a lock. So you actually have to depress it to you know, release it. And then when you put it back on, the lock grabs. And so you don't accidentally lose your lens hood. <laughs> Which, you know, and, and I know, by the way, Sean said, all our lenses come with lens hoods. It's not like some manufacturers where the lens hood is another $60. <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's see here. What other, uh, uh, let's see, what other questions we got in here? Um, this one I am going to answer from Alan. Uh, with Sigma bringing out the 24 f3.5, can you advise on any news of the 24 millimeter f1.8 being released? Um, so I know everyone has always been asking every single week about when the, uh, next series of prime lenses that we have coming out are. So that would be our, uh, 1.8 series. Um, unfortunately guys, I don't have any new information about, uh, when those are coming out other than what was in the original statement, uh, about those lenses coming. Um, but rest assured they are coming. Um, the 70 to 300 was also on that list. Uh, it just came out earlier. Uh, same with that 85 1.8. So um, just keep keep attached to all the social channels. Uh, keep checking out Lumix Live. As soon as we have any information about when those lenses are coming out, it will be shared out. Uh, I know uh, it's not the best news everyone wants to hear. Everyone wants you know those new lenses that come out. But uh, one thing that I will always firmly stand behind is that you don't want companies rushing lenses out, especially when you look at what we've done with like the 85 1.8 and the 70 to 300, the engineering that goes into them to make them not just your typical lenses. Um, all of our lenses have a standard that they have to be kept to. Uh, and in general, again, you want it to come out right. You don't want it to come out rushed uh, and, you know, missing this feature or that feature. Uh, so just hang in there. They'll, They'll come out um, hopefully soon. I uh, don't have any specific dates on that for you guys. Um, let's see what other questions. Uh, as a reminder, again, if you guys have questions, uh, drop them in the chat by tagging at Lumix Cameras. Um, let's uh, let's let's uh, jump over to that um, the images and stuff that you sent over, Shiv, and we'll. Uh, I think before we go yeah. there, Sean, just a couple of other points, if I may make them. Yes, go uh, ahead. One. Yeah, one of the one of the key things that uh, we as nature and wildlife photographers are looking for is to reduce the amount of kit that we carry. Mm -hmm. And the the one thing that most nature wildlife photographers also tend to do 
is to do macro photography. And I think the important feature that this lens has is that at 300 millimeters, I mean, at both F, at uh, 70 as well as at 300 millimeters, the close focusing distance is absolutely fabulous. But more importantly, at 300 millimeters, you have a half macro lens. So there again, not only is it a nice light lens, but if you're not so particular about the definition of macro being one for one, a half macro works just as well because if you've got this lens mounted on an S1R, you've got 48, you know, if you go even 50%, right, you've still got over 20, 21, 24 megapixels to deal with. And just remember that people were shooting macro back in the old days with 10 megapixel cameras and there was no problem. So if you, if you want to use this in its, you know, fancy terminology of being one for one macro, for a moment, just think about it. You've got a full macro capable lens. And let me ask you, which person is going to say, was that shot one for one? <laughs> Nobody writes that on their images, do they? Shot one for one? No, you, it, you create the macro image and that's what you want to show. And, Very true. And one other, one other absolutely exceptional thing about this lens, I mean, you probably read about, you know, it's got this, uh, you know, great combination of ED and UD lenses and stuff all that. But I think there's two things that are really important about lens construction. It's how is the glass ground? And if you look at even expensive lenses from other manufacturers, the glasses are, quote, aspherical. And what that means is that when you are looking at certain images, particularly in light situations where there's variability of light, you will get what's known as onion ringing. I mean, it looks like, you know, concentric circles in your image. But a truly spherical lens that is not, uh, is, is kind of polished perfectly round will never give you onion ringing. So this lens has that function or that feature that to me is absolutely fabulous. And it also helps if you're looking at, you know, will the lens flare a lot? I mean, a true spherical lens, the flaring is going to be far less. So, you know, you really have an exceptional lens at a phenomenal price point with phenomenal capabilities. Now, you know, you might say, oh, this guy's a, uh, you know, Panasonic Lumix ambassador. Of course, he's going to say good things about it. So rather than say good things about it, Sean, you wanted to show some images. So let's show the images yeah. and make sure that people understand. It's just not me chatting. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just before we go uh, on to this one, I, just do, I do just want to address a couple of the questions that came in there. Um, so uh, Dave was asking, with the S5 and full frame, does the 70 to 300 millimeter operate as a 70 to 300, or is it doubled as is the case with the 100 to 400 for micro four thirds? Um, so for anybody that's getting into full frame or into the, the Lumix ecosystem, we have the two mounts. We have micro four thirds and we have full frame. Lenses almost universally are typically marked as what their actual millimeter range is. So that's actually physically what the lens is designed to be. Uh, in micro four thirds, you typically would have to double the number that you see on the lens to get an effective field of view. Um, so what you would be used to thinking in 35 millimeter full frame. When it comes to the S5 and lenses like the 70 to 300 or 24 to 70, it is it's what you see is what you get. The focal length that's written on the lens is the focal length that you're seeing. So you don't have to worry about any of that, um, the math to figure out field of view. And the follow-up on that was actually from Ron, which is asking if you change to an APS-C mode, will you get a 1.5 crop? Um, that is correct. If you were shooting a full-frame camera in APS-C, or if, say, you take this lens and put it on one of the APS-C L-mount cameras, you're going to multiply that, that field of view for the, the quote-unquote crop factor. So you can get a longer lens with it. Um, so typically... 
in cases like that, it's it's always going to be what you're seeing is what you're getting. You're not having to do any math to figure out what the focal length is. The cool thing is on the Lumix cameras, at least on the S series, we actually read out what uh, millimeter or what focal length you're at while you're zooming uh, on the S series. So you'll know 70 millimeter is 70 millimeter. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, were there any other questions before we jump to the next one? Um, Deborah asks, uh, when will the next camera come out? Um, no idea. Um, keep, keep subscribed and, uh, uh, keep on all the email lists and stuff. That's, that's, that's where everyone will know when we have new stuff coming out. Um, all right. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the, um, or continue the conversation with the lens here. So, um, I've got the, the photos that you, um, had sent over. Uh, so we'll, we'll just kind of cycle through them when, uh, you want me to go to the next, uh, next picture. Yeah. W one of the things, Sean, that, uh, you know, the, the, the individual who asked the question about, you know, is this lens a 70 to 300 on the camera or do you have any crop factor? Just as a recommendation, um, if you have a full frame camera and you're using a, a lens like this, by taking that camera and structuring it into an APS-C form factor, yes, will visually give you the ability to reach out further per se. But in reality, there is no reaching out further that is happening. <laughs> so rather than do that, my recommendation is put this on, shoot like you would in a full frame, and then once you got your image, you can process it by cropping down as much as you want to give it that incremental, quote, reach. So th there's a little bit of an anomaly over here, but I just want to make sure that maximize the use of the sensor in your camera to its fullest extent, and then crop as you need. I mean, that, that'll really help you compose better. It'll help you get better images. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 definitely great advice for anyone that's that's jumping in with this. You should always shoot the highest quality that your camera can offer you. So, um, let's see here. So we got the Im the 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 images loaded up here. So um, I know the the first slide you had up here was that that specification slide. Yeah, we've um, already talked about that, so we can probably <laughs> skip through. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let's let's uh, talk about some of these images you got here. All right. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I like to do when I get any lens is I also want to see how does this lens behave with some of the features that are available in the camera that it's mounted to. So the image that you're seeing is actually a JPEG rendition. It is actually a JPEG capture using post focus. And Using post-focus, what you want to make sure is that will the re lens render the image like it is physically, or will issues of focus breathing or uh, you know focus expansion, as it's called, will it affect the final output of the image that you're trying to capture? So this was shot using post-focus and the image was combined in camera. It was not something that was brought into, you know, third party software or into Photoshop and then combined, it was combined into camera. And this is the actual output from the camera itself as a post-focus JPEG rendering. In this particular case, I did not do any kind of a range merge. This is a full auto merge. And if any of you who have used that feature in <laughs> Panasonic cameras, range merge allows you to select the front point and the farthermost point, and then the camera will merge just that segment of images. If you let it do auto merge, it'll merge the entire uh, set of images that it captured. So giving both camera and lens their due I think this lens performs exceptionally well in this situation, as did the camera. Yeah. So, I know we've got a, right. a couple more images here, yeah. Yeah, so uh, th this particular image, the reason for this is I wanted to see how it renders uh, in extreme cold conditions. And as you can see, the, the leaves are totally withered. This was close to about minus 22 degrees. 
And I shot this at f5.6, uh, ISO 100. There is a one-stop exposure compensation for the snow, but the lens stayed outside in cold for about eight hours before this image was taken, and the focusing mechanism and everything performed flawlessly. <laughs> Ah, some so some, I'm some a bokeh bit of a shots. Pain when it comes to these lenses, they don't like me in the end. But you know what? Hey, <laughs> that's that's what one's supposed to do. All right, this image uh, shot indoors. Uh, basically, the idea here is, you know, can I use long exposures? Can I get good bokeh out of this lens? Uh, the the wine bottle and the glass and the book and the the spectacles are are foreground segments in front of a Christmas tree, which should have been pulled down, but it was still up. And <laughs> those are the Christmas lights of the tree. And you can see the perfect or close to perfect round. I mean, remember that these Christmas tree lights are not round. Uh, they are slightly uh, oval or elliptical, as you might want to call it. But still, the rendition of the bokeh is beautiful. And the transition from bright to dark does not have any onion ringing. And that's the key to a good lens. So hopefully you get an idea of the quality that this lens produces. And we'll go through a few more images to show you what else, the, as far as aspects of the lens are concerned, are that will make you really feel comfortable with a product like this. Yeah, and this is actually one of the points that I think I, I, I wanna kind of expand on too. When it comes to that bokeh, you know, you were talking about how a lot of lenses will have aspheric elements built into them. Um, some lenses don't use aspheric elements. And this is one of those cases where we're not using aspheric elements in this lens, even though we have lenses like our 50 millimeter F 1.4, which produces arguably some of the best bokeh um, that I've, I've seen, which does use aspheric lenses that are uh, very, very painstakingly, um, hand polished for the molds to cr to get rid of that onion skinning, and I think when when we get into looking at you know how many different lenses are out there and what what the optic effects can do, you know, going this route I think does produce that obviously quote unquote maybe like an easier quote unquote manufacturing process, but that that lack of you know not even having the the chance to have that onion skinning effect is is such a big push on this and even with we're going to talk about it a little bit later i think but even with how the aperture blade is designed to yep. aid in that look um, as we cover further all of these things play into how you get really good looking bokeh that's not distracting that doesn't you know kind of scream at you like oh this is a quote-unquote cheap lens kind of thing um you know, I, I really wish, Sean, there was a way to show the inside of this lens comfortably on, on, the, on YouTube. But if you look at the inside of this lens and you open it up and you close down the aperture blades, you know, using the camera, you will see that you have a perfect round as far as the aper aperture opening is concerned. And, and that's the rounded blade formation that really makes a huge difference in, in how bokeh is created as well as you know other other features that we'll be discussing yeah yeah so um let's let's take a look at this you know a, a lot of people don't necessarily think telephoto lenses and landscapes and there you go yeah so this is actually 12 images uh stitched together and these were shot at 120 millimeters so not exactly halfway, but kind of halfway. Um, 10 seconds exposure for each image with an overlap of about 40% at ISO 100. So once again, what are we looking for over here? Why bother doing a panorama like this? <laughs> the real thing is, if your lens has distortions, particularly long focal length lenses, because in a real wide angle lens, you typically end up using only the central portion of the lens to do your panoramas. You, you throw the top away, you throw the bottom away. 
But in a, in a long lens, the distortion that the lens creates will never let you properly stitch your images. So the, the test over here is to get 12 images or more perfectly aligned. And unfortunately, we can't expand on this over here. But if you would like to, it is on my, I think I put this on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, you're most welcome to go there and, and look at it blown up. And you can see the amount of detail there is in all the windows and all the little structures of these buildings. So that, that was really the purpose of this test. Yeah. All right, let's see here. There we go. All right. More, so here, more architecture. Here I'm looking for, sorry? More, more architectural shots. More architectural shots. And again, uh, the purpose over here is to see, am I going to end up with any fringing, uh, whether it be purple or green fringing, or is there going to be any other kind of chromatic aberration that the lens may, you know, produce when uh, you're taking images of this sort? Uh, this is at f9. So I'm going beyond, quote, the sweet spot of the lens. This lens is actually, uh, I found it has two really, really sweet spots, uh, five, six, and F9. I mean, they are just absolutely exceptional. Uh, this was handheld, one uh, sixtieth of a second at uh, ISO 100, uh, really checking a couple of other things out. How does the image stabilization of this lens perform? in conjunction with the image stabilization of the camera. So, you know, a long lens like this, handheld at 1 60th of a second, um, it's sharp as sharp can be, and there is no distortion whatsoever, and there is no chroma. Yeah. It's kind of like, like you know, go, going back to those old days with the, uh, the you know, kind of cheaper, inexpensive, uh, 70 to 300s were like, you really had to stick to the old one over focal length rule to, to be able to shoot any kind of distance with those. I think that, that, oh, yeah. that stabilization is awesome. You know, I, I don't, I don't even think about that rule anymore because <laughs> I mean, unless, you know, I know that I'm going to some ridiculous exposure, you know, down to one twentieth of a second or one tenth of a second. And I'll say, oh, you know, I better get a tripod out, but yeah. stabilization, you know, and, and, and this, you know, combination of the lens being stabilized and the body being stabilized really helps. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. What was, uh, what, right. what was the so goal this, with this one? This one. This one is, it was an interesting image that I wanted to capture. Again, I wanted to see, will I get any kind of edge distortion? And will I have a situation where... And, and I like going to this building to test lenses out. So this is this has been done over and over again. Uh, unfortunately, it was a very snowy day, so the very tip of this was covered in snow, and uh, you know I had to lose it. But you can see a very very slight amount of inward bowing that is taking place, but that is because of the angle of attack, as far as uh, this image is concerned. So don't view that as being, uh, you know, an anomaly of the lens. It is not. The real anomaly of the lens, if you were to look at, is you would find the top two corners distorting, and there is absolutely no distortion as far as this lens is concerned. <laughs> Again, uh, F6.3, and here's the kicker. Handheld, 1 15th of a second. I saw 100. <laughs> But what adds to it is there is an exposure compensation on top of that of one stop. There you go. So there you, you go. want to talk stability, this lens takes the cake. <laughs> All right. What about this one here? Again, uh, another uh, image. Now, this was shot at uh, 1 one twenty fifth of a second at f8. Um, again, you can see beautiful rendition, no, no significant bowing, no distortion, uh, and absolutely no chromatic aberration at all. In a building like this with so much glass, uh, on a pretty bored sky, uh, you would tend to see purple fringing, uh, but there is none. Yeah. Uh, and we've, we've got a, a FC photos asking which camera you were using to capture these. Uh, this was with the 
Okay, this day, yeah. So it was the uh, S1R. S1R, cool. So yeah, there's there's a mix of of cameras that you were shooting with this uh, lens on, right? Yeah. yeah, I shot the majority of the images with the S1R and the S5. Uh, there were a few uh, images, but we were not showing any video that I did as video uh, using the S1H. Cool, cool. Okay, now now for for all the people that um you know, really want to see about, you know, the wildlife applications for this. Um, let's, let's, uh, uh, talk about some of those images here. Yeah. So this was, uh, F5.6. Now when we get to wildlife, we want to shoot at a higher shutter speed because wildlife doesn't sit still. You want to really get a sharp image. You want to have an ISO of birds that are swimming like this. Once you've decided what aperture you're going to be comfortable with, you basically say my minimum shutter speed needs to be at least one one thousandth of a second. So you now you compensate or use auto ISO to let the camera do the rest. The idea here is to get the cache light in the eye, to get the colors correct, and to get great detail in white feathers. Now the white feathers over here, if we were to expand it, you will see that they are all individual and completely sharp and in focus. What I want yeah. to also add is this was shot on the S5, uh, and this is a 50% crop. There so I'm go. using a 600 millimeter lens? Yes, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, you know that's 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 one of the things that I've I've loved, you know, kind of shooting around with the lens for the last um, the last couple of weeks that I've had it here. You know, seeing that you know most most people connotate a seventy to three hundred millimeter lens with a you know kind of inexpensive you know kind of throw in the bag just because you want a little bit of extra reach, and this lens I. I, I can't help but think that, you know, as, as I mentioned last week, that this is kind of the antithesis of that. That this was not designed as a just throw in your bag, inexpensive, you know, just to get reach lens. It It is designed so you can be shooting at, say, 300 millimeter and do a 2x crop into it and not run into the issues that those lesser expensive lenses typically mm -hmm. exhibit, you know, the, the softness yeah. and the flare, uh, the, the fringing things like that. So seeing, seeing a shot like this, that you're able to do that crop with and effectively get the quote unquote 600 millimeter field of view. <laughs> well, while still having really good resolution, I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of the advantage of full frame and mm -hmm. high resolution cameras. So, I mean, the, the reason, the reason why, you know, I said, earlier when we were started the presentation is, you know, crop afterwards, don't, don't crop before, because it's, it's always so much nicer to be able to then get what you're looking for the way you want to compose it. Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right. So here's, here's a, uh, another test for the lens. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, how well or how quickly or how fast does a lens focus? Uh, you know, you, you have, a number of algorithms that you're trying to take into consideration. Number one is, you know, the, the computational power of the camera itself. Number two, how confusing is the background versus foreground subject? Uh, this is not a black background. This is, you know, just conifers in the distance. The image was shot F8, and this is counter to what I normally would do. Uh, but because the shutter speed needs to be high, the shutter speed was one two thousandth of a second at ISO 1600. Again, camera handheld, and I'm using the central area focusing, but no tracking. So I'm actually tracking by hand. Now, for those of you who like back button focus, I'm going to give you a little tip as far as the cameras that have this capability. Yes, use back button focus if you want, but what that's going to do is it's going to take away the ability for your thumb to move the joystick 
to position the focus point appropriately when you're following subjects. So you can either be back button focusing or you can be using the joystick, but you can't do both. You only have one thumb, right? <laughs> so what I've decided and what I've come up with, and I'm going to put up my S1R over here, and you can do this with the G9, you can do this with the S5, you can do it with any of the cameras that have extra buttons in front, okay? So now if I'm holding the camera, I've got my finger on the shutter button, I've got my thumb on my joystick at the back, and then I have these two buttons where I've got two fingers to play with them. I set the top button to do front focus priority, and I set the lower button to do back, but, uh, to back focus priority. So for those cameras that have this feature, I'm actually using four fingers in my hand to do my wildlife photography. When I use the front focus priority, the camera is always going to be looking for a contrast closer to the camera. It'll never focus on the background. You will never lose your subject. And all of your hand holding becomes so much easier because you're not struggling with the back button. I let the back button just do its own sweet little thing. And I'm concentrating on my joystick because to me, that's the most important thing when there are subjects in motion. So hopefully that helps as a tip for those folks who want to try it out. It does take a little bit of getting used to, but remember you didn't give, you didn't have five fingers just to leave three of them hanging around, right? So use them. <laughs> um, let's hear. So a uh, couple, couple questions that uh, people were asking here. So, um, FC uh, was saying he assumes that that was shot with animal uh, autofocus, but no, as you said, th this was kind of uh, this was center point or one area tracking uh, it and is manual. A central area. So uh, uh, the diamond pattern that uh, you get, which is one to the fourth one from the right on your focusing. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, this question for uh, was from Keith. This is more of a, a general question about the lens. It says, uh, I shoot cl classical concerts from the back of an auditorium. Uh, could I use this lens with the 2X teleconverter adapter? If not, could this potentially be added firmware update? Um, sorry, Keith. Uh, the 70-300 does not have the physical capability to attach to the tele uh, 2X teleconverter or even the 1.4. Uh, those, those teleconverters, like pretty much any teleconverter, typically seats down into the barrel of the lens on the back. So they have to be designed to take it in there. Um, the other thing too, to, to kind of take into consideration with a lot of, a uh, lot of lenses like this that are variable aperture, um, the 2X teleconverters or even the 1.4s in a lot of cases will drop the f-stop value dramatically as you're adding those teleconverters on there to where it's not really going to get you anything that's great in the long run. Uh, but one of the cool things, so with Keith, what you're shooting, uh, if you're using a camera like the S5 uh, or you're using something like an S1 or something like that, and say you're filming in 24 frames per second, you can always go into the camera menu and change the record area for it. So instead of recording full frame 24, uh, the 24 megapixel sensor, you could put it in super 35 crop or APS-C crop on the uh, S5, or even drop into one, one to one pixel ratio, which would effectively give you a teleconverter effect um, when we're talking about video. Um, yeah. In stills mode, unfortunately, there's no uh, APS-C photo mode uh, in the full frame cameras. Uh, so as Shiv was talking about before for photography, just shoot the full 24 uh, yeah. megapixel full frame width and then just crop it and post later. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, you want if you're doing concert photography is you want to be able to suck in as much light as you can because they're, they're never brightly lit. They're usually in a semi-dark environment. And by putting a teleconverter on, as Sean said, you know, if you put a 2x teleconverter, you're going to lose two stops of light. And when you lose two stops of light, not just the fact that you're going to have to up your ISO, which is then going to up the noise, 
but your focusing speed will become slower because it just can't open up quick enough to uh, you know grab the the contrast detection or the depth of uh, you know depth from defocus ability so why risk it you know use the lens yeah. as is and then you know maximize its uh, aperture crop it later yeah and that's it's that's a pretty similar thing on almost any focusing system that you use out there is that every focusing system needs light and some sort of contrast yep. to be able to figure it out. Um, it's either both of them or one or the other. So that's typically why you don't see variable aperture lenses um, or lenses that are outside of like the two eights. Um, even the F fours, I'm personally always surprised that the F four lenses from most manufacturers can accept a teleconverter. I've always thought personally that that's a bit pushing it for using a 2x converter unless you're out in ultra bright daylight um but yeah so little little things there if if you're looking and you need that teleconverter then highly suggest the 70 to 200 28 for something like that as shiv said yeah. you want to maximize the amount of light you can get in you want to minimize how much you lose when you put a, tel a teleconverter on there um yeah just different different options though yeah, a two x a two x teleconverter on a two eight lens will take you up to five six, and that's that's fine. But if you're going, you know, five six on the long end, putting a two x teleconverter, uh, you, you're talking, you know, f eleven. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's say, uh, how about how about this this uh, little guy? All right. So this little guy, uh, what was interesting with this is it's a very, very similar kind of shot as the previous one. Uh, th this bird was, you know, wanting to climb onto a perch and it kept doing this about, you know, a few times. So I said, all right. But what I found interesting was that there was a, just a little bit of side light coming and it was hitting the, the, the little ruffled feathers on the end. And just to get that detail to show the amount of detail you can... Now... I'm going to tell you that this is a one quarter crop. Wow. So on the S5, it's taking 25% of the sensor to get this detail. <laughs> Which goes to show you again, you know, shoot, shoot the full resolution that you can. You can always crop later because if you've got a good solid sharp lens that optically is, is keeping up, you can always crop. Right. I mean, this again, F8, you know, one two thousandth of a second, and ISO 1600. And then, again, you know, part of it is, you know, the camera performs beautifully in, in high ISOs. At least the S5 is great for that. Um, and we'll see some more later. Yeah. There we go. There's more details there. Yeah, more details. Basically, uh, you know, again on a on a very snowy day, uh, the background was kind of totally getting washed out, and I wanted to see what I would be able to do with a bird that was similar in tones and color as the background. Uh, so, you know, again, testing out the speed at which it focuses. This is at uh, five six, um, and. Because the bird is not flying, there's no rapid movement. I had the shutter speed down to one one hundredth of a second at ISO 200, and I didn't find any issues. Nice. Let's see here. <laughs> there we go. So again, uh, you know, uh, crazy situations. I'm looking for, you know, what can I get as far as Feather detail is concerned. Um, F5.6, 1 3 20th of a second at ISO 640. It was pretty late in the evening. Uh, the sun had gone practically to the horizon. As you can see, the light is hitting the forehead of this bird uh, and the, uh, the wing shoulder area, and there's no light at the back. So it's practically coming you know, horizontally across, skimming the water. And, uh, you know, Again, not a rapid movement over here, but just, you know, will it get good low light detail? And it does. <laughs> so another handheld shot, uh, you know, F5, 6, 1, 125th of a second. Uh, the 
the ISO was 640. So you can understand how dark it was. This was in the major snowstorm uh, last week, actually, earlier last week. So, uh, you know, I had a lot of fun uh, in the snow and I was outside. Uh, the lens was covered, as was everything else. Um, one of the things that I wanted to see if I would have an issue with, which does happen in lenses that do not zoom internally. So if a lens is not going to zoom internally, you have to watch out that if this area gets covered with water or gets covered with snow, and then you draw the lens back in, will it suck all that moisture into the lens? And I can tell you that the weather sealing in this is, is darn good, and I did <laughs> not get any water in the lens, so I'm pretty happy. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we have a, a question from Albert here for you, Shiv. Um, so when, and, and Albert, I'm taking a little bit of liberty because I think you're referencing the lens on the different camera bodies, but how, so how does the, um, or how was the handling um, using this lens between something like an S5 and an S1R, knowing that they're very different body designs and sizes? Um, the lens is light and it pairs beautifully with both cameras. One of the things that I found is that when I had it on the 5 and I wanted to use a tripod with a gimbal to do some of my pan shots and things like that, um, I actually adapted it with a long lens foot so that I would get better balance on the camera. So the lens foot would come out here and with the S1R, which is a much, much heavier camera, you definitely need to adapt something to do any kind of work on a gimbal. But hand-holding, this lens is just ideal. I mean, it's so comfortably balanced that you don't need anything. And, you know, that's probably the main reason why this lens doesn't come with a collar or a foot, because you don't need it. I mean, it's just perfectly balanced. Yeah, you know, there's 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 so many different um, you know styles that that a lot of people will will adopt with you know when picking what lens for your solution there. And I would I would venture to guess that the majority of wildlife photographers that are probably using gimbals, using you know the larger setups for that probably are going to lean more into something like the 70 to 200 28 with a teleconverter or something much longer than what a yes. lot of these lenses do. Yep. And I think that's, that's kind of the nice thing that where this lens falls is that, you know, you have something that you can put on a gimbal. Um, albeit mm -hmm. it's like you pointed out, it's a little different than the normal way of working with something yep. like the 70 to 200 28. But it, it really does, you know, beg to be handheld, you know, for getting into it. So, like, this, from coming from someone who really doesn't shoot a lot of long telephoto lenses, I've never really been a telephoto lens shooter. This is probably one of the most fun lenses that I've actually shot with in a long time because it's not following, at least the way I had always thought, the typical tropes of a telephoto lens where, you know, they typically would be big and cumbersome or, you know, they're not necessarily the best out at the long telephoto range where this kind of was the exact opposite of that. Um, basically did everything and, uh, that I know, wanted to, to, to Albert's do. Question, to, to Albert's question, sorry, Sean, uh, that, you know, it's one of the things that people say, well, how does it feel? Well, it's kind of hard to say how a lens feels because I don't know what you know, how big your hands are. Uh, you know, people with, with big hands may find it to be very comfortable. Somebody with smaller hands may say it's not as comfortable. But the way the lens actually works for from a from a landscape or a wildlife photography point of view, because it's it's ideal for both. I mean, that 70 millimeter to 120 to even 150, perfect for doing you know, intimate landscapes and the 300 great for doing wildlife is that your hand naturally goes to the zoom and your thumb and forefinger go 
just naturally go to the focusing ring if you are one of those that likes to, you know, fine tune your focus. But what I would suggest to you is, you know, if you get an opportunity, go to your local, you know, camera store, pick up the lens, mount it on your camera body and get a feel for it till you test it out physically. It's asking somebody how it feels is okay because how it feels to me may not be how it feels to you. So test yeah. it out. That's my recommendation. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Uh, CM is asking uh, what what lens what camera I was showing the lens on. So this is attached to the S5. Um, I just it looks a little my S5 looks a little different because I have a small rig uh, L bracket attached to it, uh, which gives me that Arca plate on the bottom, the Arca plate on the side, uh, and then I can attach my full size HDMI yeah. uh, adapter to it. Um, one of the one of the things I, I that I think um, kind of gets gets overlooked a lot with these kind of lenses is kind of in line with with what we were just talking about, you know, about how the how the lens feels when it's attached to a camera. Um, most of the time, I would say it's fair to fair to say that most seventy three hundred lenses that have been out there um, up until recently were typically lesser build quality. You know, maybe maybe cheaper. Um, or not cheaper, but, you know, lesser attention to detail to things like weather resistance and Can we say the physical plasticky? materials. Yeah, yeah, very, very plasticky. And one of the the, the things that I, I, I noticed first, you know, the, the, the second I took this thing out of the box, um, and again, echoing Shiv's point, for anybody, you know, once this lens actually starts getting into the stores, which should be sometime next month, I believe, um, you know, Getting your hands on it, you'll be able to kind of confirm the things that we're saying. But, you know, simple stuff like the choice of the, the rubber material that was used on the barrel. The fact that on the AFMF switch, there's a little, um, you know, kind of uh, marker physically on the on the lens. So you'll know when you're on that, the AFMF switch. And when you're going to shoot blindfolded. Yeah, there you go. Um, but... <laughs> More importantly, one of the things that I've I've always I've always enjoyed about shooting with with the Lumix cameras in general, which is why I wanted to join the company, was that when you start shooting with some of this stuff, you start to get that muscle memory built in. You know what, you know how you're going to use the lens across the board, and simple little touches like having that registration mark where the AFMF switch is, knowing that if I have my hand on that, I know. Right, that the the switch right above that is my limiter. Yeah. The switch right below that is my uh, OIS switch. The switch all the way on the bottom, which you're really never going to have to change that often, is the lock switch. It it's little pieces like that, as well as the fact that it's fully weather resistant, just like you were saying. So you don't really have to worry as much with uh, uh, moisture on the lens barrel itself. Uh, it's balance on with these cameras for those that are filmmakers with something like this. Um, on an S5 in particular, you do something to do to note is you do want to have your tripod plate down here should be more than enough space to clear for most, uh, tripods there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so much attention put into a lens like this that most other examples of these kinds of lenses don't have that much effort put into their design. You know, Sean, I was very impressed with when I first started you know, playing with the, the Panasonic cameras is that they followed a very set sort of set guidelines. You talk about that little dimple to the AFMF switch. It's the same thing like the double dimple on the ISO button of all yep. the, the cameras. So you know, oh, I've got my finger on the ISO button, go left one, it's white balance, go right one, it's, uh, you know. It, yeah. it, those are the little, little attention to detail that makes you know for a for a quality product yeah so let's see here um oh wow i didn't realize that we're already we're already pretty much at at two uh, pretty much at two o'clock so we'll let's um let's grab a couple more of these images and then yeah. um we'll uh we'll we'll continue on um so we got a was this a uh seagull yeah the, the, uh, or a no, it's a gull <laughs> <laughs> it's a gull there's no such thing as a seagull but it's a gull, and again, uh, another handheld shot, one one thousandth of a second, and this is 
no crop at all. It's full detail as rendered. Nice. This one is, uh, the next one is about an APS-C size crop, uh, F8, uh, 1-800, ISO 400. See the detail. I mean, I just love the way this lens renders everything sharp and no issues whatsoever. Nice. And this one here, again, is uh, pretty good as far as depth of field handling is concerned. This was at f5.6, and you can see it's, uh, you know, got most of the creature well well handled. Again, full frame, no crop over here. Yeah. Uh, you've already seen that. Some more landscape shots if we want to go to the next yeah. one. Yeah. Um, Again, you know, looking at what happens if you're going to do slow shutter speeds, if you're going to do anything like that, uh, you know, any kind of a problem that arises when you have your um, stabilization on and you're on a tripod, will the lens continue to kind of try and stabilize when it shouldn't? Uh, these tests were for that particular purpose. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, some flowing water. Uh, again, fast shutter speed, just to see, uh, you know, attention to detail. Looking more at corner rendition than just the subject itself. We go to the next one. A similar test for, uh, you know, image stabilization. One sixtieth of a second, again, on a tripod. Uh, these were shot with the S5. Nice. Nice. And again, another one of the similar kind of an example, but this one is 1.3 seconds, so it's pretty slow shutter speed. Um, again, didn't lose any detail anywhere. <laughs> and we can go to the tree, the next one, the next one. Yeah, there we okay. go. So this one here, again, basically to test for any kind of chromatic aberration that might be taking place. This time against a blue sky, which tends to create more of a green fringing, but there was none. Yeah. And the second test of uh, an architectural shot, again, similar to look for fringing, uh, there was none. <laughs> uh, we can skip through the next two if you want. And this is where I want to talk about briefly about low light. Uh, yeah. This was done with the S5 and using the lens at 70 millimeters, uh, looking at the Orion constellation at uh, f4.5, which is the widest open, only a six second shot. And I have a single image. This is no stacking and I have all the detail I want in the stars. But more importantly, and unfortunately on YouTube, you can't get all the detail, but if you look at the stars in the corners, you will see that the lens does not create what's known as star coma, where a round star starts looking like a nugget. So you don't <laughs> want that. So, so that's what, what this image shows. Uh, the next one over here was, again, uh, doing another test of the camera. This is uh, the S5 uh, using live composite, uh, seeing the rendition as far as star trail and detail is concerned. Again, you're no loss of detail on the corners, and that's what I'm looking for. And also, there's no jiggling taking place, even though throughout this one and a half hours, the... Um, the camera was set to, with the um, image stabilization switch on. Yeah. So that's 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 something each, I think that's that's come a long 15 way. 15 seconds at ISO 800. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, people say, "I want, I want, I want." You know, lenses that do all kinds of crazy things. Well, you have a lens that will do all the crazy things you want it to. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, you, this 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 was awesome, Shiv. I know, um, you know, obviously there's there's so many use cases for a lens like this, and the the era of looking at a seventy to three hundred millimeter lens or looking at a variable aperture lens as a, you know, kind of I want to say like a low end lens really is is not not the case anymore. Um, 
No. You know, it, there there are certain things that this lens will definitely excel at, and there are certain yep. things where you may want to actually look at something like the 70 to 200 f4 or the 28 if sure. a a constant aperture and in, an internal zooming lens is something that's a priority for you. But yeah. ultimately, having all of these different options, having something in this in this uh, focal la- focal range in this size, this weight that's designed to be balanced on the S series cameras and other L mount cameras as mm-hmm. well really you know kind of shows the versatility of what is yep. available in the market across the board for the L mount um, as yeah go ahead i did i did just one i'll throw this image up just if you can see it uh, yeah this was of a circuit board taken as a macro shot with this lens and this is this is full frame so if I can, you know, cut in 50% or 25%, I have all the detail, you know. So yeah, let's, uh, let's make sure that folks understand that the capabilities of close focusing are exceptionally good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, just as a reminder to everybody too, so, so this lens, the lens that we're talking about, the Lumix S 70 to, two, 70 to 300, 4.5 to 5.6 macro OIS. Yes, I know the name. The full name is a mouthful. Um, the lens, uh, we announced it. It's open for pre-orders. Uh, in the United States, it's uh, $1,249, so um, $1,249. Uh, for those that, you know, like we were saying before, that look at a 70 to 300 and think, oh, you know, those should be ultra cheap. This is not the same lens. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at the uh, images in higher resolution that you know aren't degraded because of YouTube live streaming. Um, so Shiv, where where can people find your work, uh, see images uh, that we've shown and some other samples that you've had with the lens um, off Since this platform? Yeah. Since we've gone over, I have one more last image to show. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because this is the one feature that I'd really like to just briefly discuss. Oh, yes. So the lens, the lens has 11 aperture blades. So lenses with odd number aperture blades will create star spots or sun stars with 22 radians. Okay, so we've got 22 radial lines coming out because of this lens. But that's not all. I didn't shoot this with the sun on the edge of a branch to create this at f22. So this was shot head on. And if you can see in an image like this, a lens would typically flare. There is no flaring at all with this lens. So, you know, we talk about coatings. I think the glass has some phenomenal coatings, which really gives you the ability to capture things like this. So oh, with yeah. that, le- uh, we can go back and I'll answer your last question, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the, the, the question was, where, where can people see um, your work? Where can they see other examples uh, that aren't compressed uh, by YouTube? Okay, so all of the images, there is, there is a Panasonic Ambassador website. And I think it's not just my images, but it's all of us ambassadors who really put their heart and soul into working, you know, and showing good images that they've captured with Panasonic equipment. Uh, The Panasonic Ambassador website, if you just, you know, Google Panasonic Lumix Ambassador, it'll take you to that website and go to any of the ambassadors and you'll see their work. If you see, want to see more of my work, my website is my first name, last name. So it's www.shivverma.com. I'm also on YouTube, I'm also on Instagram, and they're all linked off the, straight out of the website. And if you have any questions, email me, call me, do whatever, I'll answer them. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, make sure that we get the, uh, the, um, link to the website down in the uh, description for this video. Uh, if it hasn't already been done, uh, I know that, you know, as we said, uh, it's been a little crazy down here getting all the schedules and stuff organized. So some things are a little behind on, on my end here, but, uh, yeah, Shiv, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today and, uh, you know, giving all this information to, to everyone who joined in. Thank you, Sean. And uh, yeah, really, folks, you know, this is all hands-on experience. Uh, you know, 
nobody gave me a script of what to shoot and what to say. So <laughs> this is straight from the horse's mouth as it's supposed to come out, right? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks again, Shiv. Um, and I, thanks, I, I'll, I uh, uh, look forward to having you on in, in, in a future session. Maybe we can do a direct, you know, like macro session if, if uh, enough people want to see actual sure. like macro photography. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Would love to All do right. that. And to the audience, uh, thank you for being patient and, uh, you know, sitting through and watching all this. But uh, <laughs> look forward to having you back again. Yeah. All right. So, um, again, th thank you, everybody, for, for uh, joining in with us. Um, we will be live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to get the link up for next week's session. Um, so that, that should be going up uh, shortly, at least by tomorrow. Um, again, uh, if this was your first time, thank you for joining us. If you guys have been joining us for the last couple of, well, the last year, uh, it's incredibly, uh, you know, greatly appreciated uh, all the attention that you guys have provided and all of the conversations that you guys have in the chat. I know that we didn't get to everybody's questions all the time, uh, but make sure to be um, either sending them on the chat here, or you can send them over to our email address, which is lumixlive at us.panasonic.com. Uh, we get all of the stuff there. Uh, we can build future uh, content off that. So if you guys have suggestions for future uh, streams that you want to see, make sure to send them over there. Uh, if you guys have uh, questions for... Uh, Basically, anything else, make sure to do that live on the stream here. Uh, as a reminder, we have the Lumix Pro services. Uh, obviously, we want to keep the lights on and all that fun stuff. <laughs> I guess that's the phrase that's used a lot. Um, so we have the Platinum service, the Red membership. Um, definitely check those out in your local regions. Uh, and again, thank you guys. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, all that fun stuff on YouTube. And uh, we'll see you all next week.